believe it's been that long, Miranda. Um, but 2006 it is. And before that, she said she was at the, uh, she attended um, UW Madison in water resources management. And right now she is managing the technical side of our impaired waters um, work in EAO. And so with that um, grand introduction, Miranda, I'm going to hand it off to you and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate right. it. Again, give me feedback on my sound. I can unplug my headset, but it would cause me to like pop off and come back on. So right now, if... right now it sounds really good. Okay, excellent. I got this closer. We're set. I do want to work with the headset in case it it kind of drowns out the background noise. If I got the boys in the background kind of yelling. So I am working from home today. I'm joining you guys from Maplewood, Minnesota on this foggy morning, but I am very excited. Um, I, as, as Mark mentioned, I've been with the Pollution Control Agency for a while now. Um, but this is my first time presenting to this group. So it's actually kind of exciting for me. Long time listener, first time presenter. Um, and so the topic of today's uh, seminar is Minnesota's waters impaired waters past present and future and that title is purposefully vague because there is so much that goes into determining what our waters are impaired um, when i first agreed to this presentation these were front page headlines minnesota's impaired waters list was released and the news didn't seem great we had a wild and scenic river the saint croix river is impaired it's got too much phosphorus oh and half of our waters are in trouble half of our waters are impaired but you know what? That was last fall. It's been a few months and I feel like I'm going to talk about these things. But what I really want to share with you is what I feel is important about the 2020 impaired waters list. Why 2020 is an important year for water quality and assessments. And that's because we know more about our waters now than we ever did before. And that's not a flashy headline. That's not going to make front page news, but it's important. And I'm going to tell you why. So first, let's dive into impaired waters list past. I feel like because this audience is a broad, it's, it's very broad, I do need to bring it back to the Clean Water Act because our impaired waters list is a Clean Water Act requirement. All states, as mandated by the Clean Water Act, are required to do these things. We need to establish water quality standards to protect our designated uses for water. We need to monitor our waters and assess for those uses and then produce a list of all those water not meeting standards. So if a water is not meeting standards, it's considered impaired. But then after that, after we produce a list, we got to identify the pollutant sources and make the reductions needed. That's the total maximum daily load process. We're still required to do that. Oh yeah, and after that, we need to implement some changes to make necessary pollutant reductions. Now, in the time of the Clean Water Act, we were concerned with point sources. That's really what, what, what was the driver behind this. And now for anybody who works in water quality, it's non-point source pollution. It's runoff that's really driving um, our lists. And, um, and in 20, well, this is in the 70s when the Clean Water Act, of course, was, was became law. It wasn't until the 1990s where Minnesota started producing its first impaired waters list called the TMDL list or the 303D list. So if you hear those terminologies, we're talking about the same thing nowadays. Um, our TMDL list in the 90s focused on waters with point sources. And so you list the point sources, you make adjustments to the permit, you bring the water back up to standards. We all know it's not that simple. So the net, so we went beyond that in the 2000s and we started statewide assessments for water quality. And most states still do a statewide assessment every two years. And the reason we do it every two years is because that impaired waters list is required to go to EPA every two years. The next big change came in about 2008, 2010. So if you remember going to the polls in 2008, there was an amendment to the Minnesota State Constitution on the ballot, and it asked Minnesota voters, would you be willing to see an increase in your sales tax if we put that money aside to fund clean water projects, land projects, and the arts? And by an overwhelming majority, Minnesota voters said, yes, let's do that. Shortly thereafter, we had the establishment of the Clean Water Fund. The Clean Water Fund has since produced a lot of the resources needed for the PCA and other agencies to do their work to protect and restore waters. So also about this time, 2010, the MPCA redesigned their assessment process. So 
As I mentioned, we were doing a statewide assessment every two years. The data was haphazard. If you can imagine, we're doing a lot of assessments on data in the metro, but in the middle of Red Lake, we only have a couple of data points. We weren't really seeing getting a good picture of water quality in the state. So after a redesign process, the PCA went to a watershed approach to monitoring assessment. And that this is what this looks like. There are people on this call that have seen this map hundreds of times, um, but it's still an important visual because when I talk about watersheds, this is what I talk about. This is the scale I've, I'm talking about. There's 80 Huck 8s or 80 major watersheds in the state. And based on a certain cycle, we're assessing, we're assessing about 10% of the state every year. So we go to a watershed and with the help of local partners, we intensively monitor for two years. We get two years of really good data on lakes and streams in that watershed, and then we assess on the third year. And then we also have large rivers in our state. I mean, that's an obvious statement, but I'm talking about some very specific large rivers, the Rainy, the Red, the St. Croix, the Mississippi, and the Minnesota. Those are large homogenous bodies of water. We assess those every 10 years by themselves. We also do, on top of this, we look at um, statewide data on pesticides because uh, Minnesota Department of Ag is integral in that process. They collect lots of data on pesticides. We look at pesticides every other year. We look at nitrate in waters protected uh, for drinking water. And as uh, required by the Federal Beach Act, we assess Lake Superior beaches for bacteria. So this is where we're assessing. This is kind of giving you an idea of how, how we go about this. Let's talk, let's get into um, what we mean by assessing. When we are looking at the water quality on a lake or a stream, what do we want to assess? We want to assess these uses. We want to see if these uses are supported by the data or not supported by the data. And there are many different kinds of uses here in Minnesota as in other states, we have our own designated beneficial uses. Think about what you use your local stream for. These are the big ones. Um, do you want to be able to swim in a stream without getting sick? You want to be able to uh, uh, jump into a lake without big mats of algae floating around. Aquatic life, we're talking about that ecological community. We want the fish and the bugs, those aquatic macroinvertebrates to so survive and thrive in a community that we would expect to see. Aquatic consumption, if you want to eat the fish, you want it to be safe to eat. And drinking water, like I mentioned, there are sources, uh, lakes and streams that are used as sources of drinking water and as source protection, we want to make sure that those waters are low in nitrate. As I mentioned, we've got other uses, but these are the biggies that we assess for. So when we're going out and monitoring, going back to that watershed cycle, we went, when we're going out and monitoring, we wanna collect data that allows us to say something about these uses. And here's the data that we're collecting based on the use, separated by use. <clears throat> so on streams, we're talking about bacteria when we're talking about aquatic re recreation assessments. For lakes, we're talking about nutrients, which in Minnesota is phosphorus and that chlorophyll, that measure of the algal growth to prevent those nuisance blooms in lakes. Aquatic life, we're looking at a lot of stuff and especially in streams, it gets complicated real fast. It's super interesting. If you've ever been on a discussion of aquatic life you support on a stream, Oh, it's never ending. It really goes to show the complexity of our ecological systems. And all that's listed under aquatic life, you can think of as pollutants or stressors to aquatic life, the fish and the bugs community. And I'll only point out that index of biological integrity. If you don't know what that is, that is an IBI. It is a direct measurement, a score for the fish or the bug communities in a lake or a stream. So we have those direct measurements of aquatic life and also the stressors to aquatic life that we look at at the same time. And we're collecting data on all those. So aquatic consumption, mercury is the big one, but if we do have other fish contaminants, we do assess for those. And drinking water, water's protected for drinking water, we're looking at nitrate. So that's the data we're collecting. Let's spend a little bit time on, on standards. Standards are complex, they're super interesting, but I'm gonna give you some very simplified examples of how we take our standards to determine if the uses of a lake and, or stream are supported. So let's go left to right. So aquatic recreation on Brighton Beach on Lake Superior. So that's a beach where we say that aquatic recreation is fully supporting because the bacteria is low. So that's that in the red, the black text right there, that's the standard. 
um, and we've assessed that water near that beach and we've determined that aquatic recreation is fully supporting because that standard is not exceeded. A very simplified aquatic life assessment is this lake in Stearns County. We would consider this, we do consider this lake fully supporting of aquatic life because its fish IBI score is above 40. So we have that IBI score, that direct measure of a biological community, a community of the fish in this lake. It's better than 40, aquatic life is fully supported. Aquatic consumption, the third example, this is the St. Louis River. Aquatic consumption on the St. Louis River is impaired because mercury is too high. So it's not that you can't eat the fish in the, in the St. Louis River, depending on where you are, um, but you definitely want to look at the fish consumption advisories that the Department of Health puts out. So we found that fish in the St. Louis River is higher than this particular standard. Therefore, we considered we consider this pot water body impaired for aquatic consumption. Finally, drinking water. This is the Mississippi River at Royalton. It's low in nitrates. It doesn't exceed the water quality standard. And it is a protected as a source for drinking water because St. Cloud uses the Mississippi for drinking water, as you may know, the Minnesota, um, um, Minneapolis and St. Paul certainly use the Mississippi River as a source of drinking water. So large swaths of the Mississippi River are protected and we wanna make sure that they are low in nitrates as, so, as a source of drinking water. It gets a lot more complicated than this, but these are just good examples of how we apply standards to determine if our uses are being met. Now I'm going to talk about the process of water quality assessments, what we, how we get to these determinations. And I love this stuff. I find it really interesting, but it's a challenge to visually represent it. So I'm going to try this. I think of the process of water quality set assessments to kind of divide it into half. There's this automatic process where we take the data and the standards that we've already discussed and we turn a crank and we are, and we produce summaries. Summaries as a way to serve up the data in an easily digestible way because we are getting, we got lots of data. We got lots of data on lakes and streams and we've got some pretty complex standards. So we have a data, we have database, we have databases and code that do, that essentially do this cranking of the data. Then there's this manual review process, which is eyes on almost every single data point that's been collected in a watershed. And so we start with an individual, a chemist or a biologist, looking at the water quality data on a lake or stream. Then we get a group together called the Watershed Assessment Team. It's not always internal, but you can think of it as kind of a smaller group. You get the biologists and the chemists together and some other people. And at this point, you're trying, based on the data and what the chemists and biologists have found, you're trying to make a determination of the use. You're trying to say something if aquatic recreation or aquatic life is supported or not supported and if you're finding impairments. Finally, at the professional judgment group, you're presenting those preliminary determinations to a larger audience and allowing input from people that in the, might be in the watershed and might know a lot about the lakes and streams that you're assessing. So I've got two visuals to present because I think it's important to convey the complexity of our water quality assessments. It's not simple. Um, this is a picture of a Wallace. So this is a water, watershed, water assessment and listing information system. It's a series of databases and codes and relationships that turn the crank. These are the gears that work. And that middle box is just a snippet of code. Um, so this is all the stuff that makes that automatic process work. And then if you've ever heard of CARL, CARL is a con, um, comprehensive assessment review library, but nobody ever calls it that. And it's the front end to that, some of that da those database tables that I just showed you. This is where the manual review process is documented. So if you're gonna go to, so, so if you go into CARL, I got two examples, two screen captures right here. So the one on the left is some information on a lake. You're interested in this lake, Carl provides you some, some very basic information about some past assessments. Then you go into the comment screen, and this is where most of the work happens for our, um, our manual review process. So this is the complex screenshot on the right. And this is a stream. And you can see in that table, you don't, 
it's all I'm doing here is convey, conveying all the stuff that goes into that manual review. You've got the data served up on that table on the bottom, some ID, and you can click on all, all those individual data points to look at all individual results for every, for on this particular stream, for every individual result you've collected in the last 10 years. It's called the comment screen because you, um, it's very important to document the reason you make your decisions, document why you think a water body is impaired, why you think it's fully supporting of its designated uses. And so we enter comments in here to back up our rationale for our judgments. And what we're trying to get at is in a comprehensive assessment for a lake or, or a stream, we're trying to say something about our beneficial or designated uses. So here's an example of a, of a similar stream to one that we just looked at at the previous screen where we've assessed this stream and this is what we've got to say about it. Aquatic consumption, we don't have any data. Aquatic life, standards are met. And when standards are met, we're saying aquatic life is supported. And then I called out the list I mean, you don't need a, you can decode that if you wanted to, but that, that box there is just the list of the different types of data that went into this use assessment, that went into determining that aquatic life is supported on this reach. Aquatic recreation, we're saying standards are not met. We're saying that use is not supported, and the reason why is it's got bacteria problems. And then finally, as a protected source of drinking water um, or a, a water protected for drinking water, we don't have enough data to say. We don't have a nitrate problem because otherwise it would be impaired, but otherwise it's insuff insufficient information. So we've assessed a stream and this is what we have to say about it. A lot of work goes into it and a lot of work comes after. So after we've done all these assessments, we have impairments on an impaired waters list. We have our data-driven external web pages that we serve this information up on, like I showed you in that previous screen. That is from the PCA's website. Um, we have GIS shapefiles that probably a lot of you use if you're using assessed or impaired waters. That comes out of the Wallace world, that database. We can export those that data out in the form of shapefiles. Um, like I mentioned, a requirement of the Clean Water Act is to develop uh, TMDLs. We still got to do that. That's a requirement. We have assessment reports after we've done every watershed, after we've assessed every watershed. And then I have to mention, it is important, but you could spend days talking about um, the importance of the watershed approach to how we protect and restore our waters after assessment. Um, and so I've got two maps up there of the Minnesota's um, uh, RAPS approval status. So RAPS is Watershed Restoration and Protection Strategies. So not only are we still doing TMDLs, but we're going to these watersheds and we're um, laying out what needs to be done to restore the waters not meeting standards, but also very importantly to protect the waters that are meeting standards um, so that they don't make the impaired waters list. Um, so not all states are really as forward as we are when it comes to protection. So it's a really, it's really cool that we're doing this. Um, and this is all part of that watershed approach. Um, and then in addition, then Bowser, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, they do something called One Watershed, One Plan, um, where among other things, they hand out the cash to implement changes on the ground to protect and restore our waters. So water quality assessments is all this, and I'm probably forgetting a lot. Um, so that's the present world of water quality assessments. Um, but as I mentioned in the beginning, 2020 is a big deal because of that watershed approach. We started in 2010, it took us 10 years, but we've monitored and assessed every watershed in the state. So what do we have to say about it? What are all those comprehensive assessments telling us? So I'll talk a little bit about impairments specifically and then just some assessments in general. So Minnesota's impaired waters list, since we started the watershed cycle, um, we were adding give or take 600 new impairments to the list um, every two years as we were developing that list. If that seems like a lot, it is probably compared to other states. 
Um, and but it's a product of the, the watershed approach because we were getting data on lakes and streams that we knew nothing about before. So yeah, we found a lot of impairments, but we also found water is in need of protection that informs work going on down the road. Impaired waters list is about 6,000 strong over about 3,400 waters bodies of water because as you can imagine, a water body can be impaired for more than one thing at a time, more than one use at a time. If you're curious if we take things off the list, we do. Um, we can delist waters not meeting standards, and we can um, also correct uh, 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 impairments if we change standards or, or, or found a mistake. Um, but we're only removing those at a rate of about 40 per year. So we're definitely in the positive when it comes to adding our impairments, um, which based on that watershed approach and compared to what we were doing before the watershed approach is not all that surprising. So if you break down impairments by use, uh, the numbers there are counts, but it's really easy to see that it's really e pretty evenly divided. Um, a third a recreation, a third aquatic consumption, and a little bit over a third aquatic life. So the that kind of gives you the idea of where the problems are, are in our impaired waters list, and it's kind of e evenly distributed. So back to one of the headlines I started with, 56% of waters are impaired. This is a true statement. Um, previously, MPCA was communicating uh, that 40% of Minnesota's waters are impaired. So if you're wondering the discrepancy there, it's because that 40% doesn't include aquatic consumption. So if you include aquatic consumption and mercury is a big problem, 56% um, of our waters are impaired. Um, but that's a broad statement, you know, it makes headlines, but it depends on how you look at it, what you're interested in, those numbers definitely change. So about 30% of our lakes are not, uh, not are impaired for swimming. They're not meeting their recreation use and about half of our streams are not fully supporting aquatic life. Um, and that's throughout the state. But of course, depending on where you look, this definitely changes. So a couple more watershed maps for you. So this is a map of stream assessments in the state. Blue means streams are meeting, green is in the middle, and of course, red to or orange to red. Those are um, watersheds where most of our streams are impaired. So if you can think about the Northeast as being a pristine area, yeah, it's not all that surprising that a lot of streams are meeting our water quality standards for aquatic life. You get to central Minnesota, it's a little, it's a little bit more of an impairment rate, but of course, in the West and the, the Metro and the South, we're finding lots of impaired streams, lots of streams not meeting their uses for aquatic life. So for lakes, lakes, if you remember, they're a little bit less impaired for aquatic recreation. Um, the good news here is, well, in the Northeast, you expect those lakes to be meeting standards, but then they still generally are. In central Minnesota, lakes are still relatively healthy, still a large percentage of those waters are meeting aquatic recreation goals. You get to the central part of the state, yeah, we're seeing more impairments, and then to the South Central, a lot more. Um, not all that surprising when you think of the land use changes that go on from the north part of the state to the south. So that's what the 2020 impaired waters list and assessments over the last 10 years have to show for us. This is what we know about water quality in our state. And we're documenting in various wraps and one watershed, one plans, and all the and all these different products that come out of the assessment process how we can go about making changes. So I'm going to pivot to the future of water quality assessments and talk a bit about challenges. You can, I could fill a slide with challenges, right? We're all, we're, if you're working in water quality, these are the things that might keep you up at night. And I separate them into a couple categories here. So we are already dealing with land use changes and climate change. When we're implementing changes to improve or protect our water, we have to take, in these take into account these large dynamic rain events that we're getting now. And that was without a pandemic in mind. Now, focusing, this is, I'm just talking about like monitoring and assessment at this point. In a post-pandemic world, 
it's going to look a little bit different. So that watershed cycle map that I showed, the green and red one that everybody, not everybody, but a lot of you are very familiar with, that's going to change. There's going to be cascading effects from this year going forward, not only with the fact that this year we couldn't get out and sample as much as we wanted to, but uh, yeah, if you can imagine a clean water fund, if nobody's out spending money and nobody's out and we're not collecting those resources from that increased sales tax, we're going to have a harder time funding the work, not only for monitoring and assessment, but also for implementation implementation. And with implementation, everything just takes time. This in the combination of all these things, these are the ones that really extend those timelines, that idea that we want to get our waters to meeting standards. These are the things that 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 are going to lengthen that process. So now I'm going to share with you three stories as kind of highlights to the challenges to um, assessment and 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 really some I think some interesting stories that that are, are worth sharing. So let's start with getting back to the St. Croix River. So the St. Croix River made headlines um in uh, late 2020 um, but to give you a little background in 2019 in early 2019 it that was really the first time the pca did a comprehensive assessment on the st croix river i mentioned it's one of our large rivers um so it was really the first time we 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 had a, a really comprehensive assessment on this large river using new data and new standards and what we found is an impairment for excess phosphorus and algae. This is a nutrient impairment, a eutrophication impairment. And this impairment was found in the stretch between Taylor Falls Dam and to, to, down to Stillwater. And the St. Croix is an outstanding resource value. It's a wild and scenic river, and that's why it made headlines. To people kind of in the know, this impairment wasn't really a surprise. Um, and the reason being is uh, Lake St. Croix, the stretch of the St. Croix that goes from Stillwater down to Prescott, that's been on our impaired waters list for excess phosphorus and algae since 2008. Um, and there's already been work on, on a TMDL. So the sources of this phosphorus uh, problem are known. And the St. Croix River is a huge basin, covers thousands of square miles. And this one impairment highlights the importance of the watershed connection. The St. Croix River is, it, that phosphorus is coming from a huge watershed and it's coming down to this wild and scenic river. And so we need to be mindful of what's going on in that watershed in order to protect the, the this very valuable resource. St. Croix, this watershed covers two states. So it's an interesting um, example of state and federal and local entities um, really coming together to work on this particular particular river. Um, they have with the, the, the lake TMDL and they're going to continue um, uh, um, going forward. If you want more information, there is a St. Croix River Basin Alliance that you can Google. And um, that's those are all the groups that work on the St. Croix. So when the St. Croix River hit the news, I thought of it as kind of a bad news story. Um, you know, it highlights some of the problems that we're having. But um, in hindsight, it ended up, I think, being a good thing for people to know, to highlight these problems and the reason why protecting our waters are important. People didn't realize the St. Croix was impaired. They didn't realize um, how water quality standards could differ between states. They didn't realize all this stuff. So um, it was a really good learning experience for people. And so that's what I took away from the St. Croix. So the next story I'm going to tell is about Plum Creek. Um, and I like Plum Creek. Uh, it's a little tributary to the uh, Mississippi River south of St. Cloud. So in terms of scale, this is so different than the St. Croix, right? Um, so this little creek was uh, determined impaired for aquatic recreation because it had high bacteria back in 2012. But in 2020, as of the 2020 impaired waters list, it's meeting standards and we delisted it. We took it off the list. And the reason why is this guy, Jerry, and a group of very active local individuals set out to bring this water back to standards. And it really highlights the importance of local involvement in order to make change. 
Um, this group on this tiny creek, they got help from the U. They got help from a guy at St. John's University. They collected samples. They were very active in implementing changes to keep the soil from getting out of the creek, which was what brought it back up to standards. And they've got something to, for, to show for it. And so going forward, I'm hoping to see more stories like this. As somebody who manages an impaired waters list that's almost 6,000 strong, these good news stories are few and far between, and it's really good to hear them. And these are, these are the good takeaways. If you're interested more on Plum, Plum Creek, there is a story on our MPCA website. You just go to PCA, the PCA's homepage, and in the search, search Plum Creek. The last story I have for you today is about wild rice. And I think this one's interesting um, and I'll explain why. But any discussion about wild rice has to start with the cultural significance of wild rice to native peoples. So let's start with this quote. Monoman wild rice and the waters it grows from are a sacred gift from the creator. Starting around 1400, Ojibwe people were migrating westward from the East Coast, coming to the Lake Superior Basin, finding wild rice growing, fulfilling a prophecy that a new homeland waits for them where food floats on the water. Isn't that amazing? Um, so we have this plant that is so important to native peoples here in Minnesota, and we're lucky to have it, and we're lucky that it's growing. So let's start with that. We also have something called sulfate, and sulfate, SO4, is, a, is naturally occurring in water for the most part, but in the northeast, it tends to be pretty low, just like the gradation with our geological changes from northeast to southwest it's a little bit higher in the central to south Minnesota um, range. And this is what sulfate does in the environment. And no, I'm not going to quiz you on it, but the news story here is it's complicated. Sulfate gets in the environment, it interacts with the water and the sediment and the water in the sediment, and it produces sulfide. And sulfide is what harms wild rice. It causes decreased growth, decrease stands, and this is a pollutant of concern for native peoples because sulfate, though it's naturally occurring, it really is coming from point sources as well. Point sources are a source of sulfate. So wastewater treatment plants release sulfate and worth noting, mining. Sulfate is a byproduct of mining. So in Northeast Minnesota, you have tribes invested in the protection of wild rice, and you have mines that produce, that support the economy of large swaths of the state. So wild rice, sulfate, this is kind of a big deal in the, in the state of Minnesota. And you, it's, it's really unique to Minnesota, and it's, it's pretty interesting. So more on wild rice and why wild rice and impaired waters May, it, 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 why, why, it, why it's coming into this talk today. So we have a water quality standard for sulfate adopted in the 1970s. And it's pretty specific. It's an agricultural standard. Like, like that's a, so agriculture is another use. Agriculture, uh, agricultural standards are not one that we've really assessed here in Minnesota. And so the tribes, at least the last 10 years, if not longer, have commented on our impaired waters list saying, you guys are not assessing for the sulfate standard. You need to do it. So finally, about a decade ago, MPCA embarked on a, on a rule revision trying to essentially replace this 10 milligram per liter standard with something more complex that takes into account the natural sulfate. Right, so we have some areas in the state that wild rice is growing fine and sulfate is above 10. So how do we take that into account? Oh, it's that complicated graph that I just showed you of all the stuff that goes on. So we attempted to um, adopt this more complicated standard. It did not get approved. Um, so that's, a, that, that's essentially done. Um, 
In addition to that, uh, in 2015, you may or not be aware, our legislature um, uh, adopted a, a law, it's, it's on the books, that actually says the PCA can't assess and list for sulfate and wild rice. Never mind that's in clear violation of the Clean Water Act, but it exists and it's active and it's on the books, okay? So um, uh, the so here we are, it's 2020. We still haven't assessed or listed for wild rice, but the 2020 impaired waters list has not been submitted. And the reason is we're still um, we're still working on responding to comments again on sulfate and wild rice because it is so complicated and it is contentious. And um, the complex and sensitive nature of the wild rice sulfate standard is the reason the 2014 impaired waters list, if you remember or don't, it's okay. It took four years for EPA to approve um, and the 2020 list hasn't been submitted. So this is part of what I wanted to talk about today because Way back in November, it was different. I was dealing with some like big headlines. I wanted to get an impaired waters list submitted. Since then, we've had a pandemic. We're still talking about wild rice and sulfate. There's a, still a lot going on. One more thing I will say about wild rice and, and assessment is the PCA would like to assess wild rice waters for sulfate. And we would use this existing sulfate standard because that's the one that's on the books. We'd like to do that, um, but I can't promise you when. <laughs> um, we're still, um, we're thinking about how we would like to do that, but we have to engage with the tribes and we have to engage with all sorts of parties. And because it's complex, sensitive, um, I don't know when that's going to happen. I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that it will. I'm hopeful we'll be able to determine some impairments and do something about sulfate in some of these waters. I'm hopeful, but I don't know when. So that is the last story I have to really, again, drive home the complexity of our water quality standards and our assessments and things that it might, like the, in, the ter in terms of wild rice, hopefully things we'll be assessing for in the future. I have one more parting gift, um, and then, then you guys can ask me anything and everything. We'll see how it goes. Um, so I like providing resources. I like that PCA um, really is great at providing all this information in various ways to anybody and everybody who wants it. So on our PCA website, we have the impaired waters list. We have something called the impaired waters viewer. So that's a map where you can see most of the, where you can see the, the, the recent impairments, the 2020 impairments. Um, we also have something that I've and other people might re still refer to as EDA. It's a water quality data search on our on our external web page. That's where we serve up. I showed you so I showed you a screenshot of where we serve up our assessment information, but also our monitoring data straight from Equus. Um, so that's all very important. Um, Carl, if you are a PCA employee, you have access to Carl, and I would love to give you a tour if you are so interested. Um, so it's a really simple URL. That's it. Don't type Carl in your browser because then you'll get a Google search for Carl, but HTTP Carl. And then um, you're going to get three choices. Click on the blue one, and you're in. Now, you can kind of like do a dive, deep dive from there, but if you uh, get stuck, you can certainly um, ask me. I would love to talk about Carl all day. Shape files. So if you're interested in ArcMap projects, the MinGeo website does have impaired waters and assessed waters um, uh, shape files for lakes and streams. Um, if you're interested in the draft 2010 data, it's not up yet because we haven't submitted 2020. So you're going to have to ping me or some or your uh, local GIS specialist. The other thing that is pretty new that you might not be aware of and I wanted to share today is EPA's new website called How's My Waterway. This website serves up assessment data for the whole nation. So this was a was years in the uh, years in the making, but it's here for you to peruse. It's actually quite interesting if you want to see how Minnesota compares to other states. 
if you can imagine every state being responsible for their own assessment, it's going to be different. It's not like comparing apples to apples. Um, but it is interesting to see what other states are doing for their standards and for their assessments and see the how they're, I, at least I find that interesting. Um, <clears throat> if you're wondering about the St. Croix, Wisconsin doesn't think the St. Croix is impaired. Maybe it's meeting their standards. Let's put it that way. It's meeting their standard for phosphorus because their phosphorus standard is twice as high than, as, as ours. So you can find that information on this brand new website. If you want to look at Minnesota's information and see how our data are represented, it is synthesized. It has to be um, from Carl. It's not like a direct window into Carl. Things are going to look a little bit different or probably a lot different. But um, uh, we have our data up through there through the assessment of 2017, the 2018 impaired waters list. Obviously, 2020 not being submitted, not there yet, but we'll get there. Um, what's cool is if it works for you, you might want to try. There is um, a use your location component. It, this is a mobile friendly website. So you might be able to use your location. I, I'd, I'd recommend giving it a try. It's interesting. You go by a lake, hit the mobile, see what your water quality is, and you'll be able to find the PCA information if it's there um, through 2017. I have to caveat that um, the, the most lo re local da recent data is not there. But something that I really wanted to give pay to you because it is new and it's interesting, at least I think. So we've gone through impaired waters list past, present, Future, this is where to find that information. I think my talk is done. I invited you to bring some questions. I really am interested with what people are thinking after I give some presentations or I talk about water quality assessments. The questions are also are all, always an eye opener about where um, I might want to uh, talk more in the future or what, uh, what people are thinking. So I'll pause there. You guys can let me know. All right. Well, thank you, Miranda. That was a fantastic presentation, of course. Um, so if folks have questions, you certainly can just unmute yourself, or if you would rather type it into the chat, and I can kind of facilitate the questions. We can do it that way, too. So if um, you either want to just chat, you have a question, I can unmute you, or you can unmute yourself or you can just type it into the chat and I will ask Miranda your question. All right, we've got a question here from Dennis. Uh, Lake St. Croix um, at the end of the St. Croix River is impaired. Both Minnesota and Wisconsin worked on a TMDL to improve the lake. Basically the target to standards in Lake St. Croix will result in the river achieving standards upstream of the lake. Thank you. That is perfect. Um, I know that there are people on this call that know more about this stuff than I do. So that is awesome. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Scott is asking, can you talk about how Minnesota's assessment process compares to other states? What does oh, Wisconsin or Michigan or California do, for example? Oh my gosh, such a great question. I can't do a holistic approach. I, I mean, I can't tell you everything about every state. Um, if you remember that clean water, those Clean Water Act requirements, every state is going to do something different. So Wisconsin does a good job. Um, they, they, they monitor a lot of parameters, but their standards are different. Like I mentioned, the St. Croix, for, for, for rivers, they just have a phosphorus standard. Here in Minnesota, we have a eutrophication set of standards where we look at phosphorus and chlorophyll and some other stressors. So those are examples. So standards are going to be different. What is also going to be different is how um, states define their water bodies. So we call our water bodies AUIDs or WIDs, right? So we think of, uh, when we think of Minnetonka, we think of it as a lake, but it's actually 17 WIDs. So they're individual compartmentalized so we can better assess the quality of one part of a lake. We do that. And streams we divide up. Um, so streams are reaches vary significantly, tiny reaches, big reaches, and the driver there is to get a whole a good idea of uh, the aquatic life. So we chop those streams up based on channelized reaches, naturalized reaches. So that's what Minnesota does. Other states, using Pennsylvania as an extreme example, they chop their streams up into half mile segments. So they have thousands upon thousands of stream assessments to, to work with. They only do these tiny chunks. 
And so if you're looking at, wow, they got tons of assessments, well, if you, do, if you worked out the river miles, maybe it's something similar. Um, so those are some examples. Um, Ohio, totally different. They do watershed-based assessments. If they have a, a, a one lake in a huck that's impaired, they consider that watershed impaired, and then they work on that impairment. That's another different example. So more familiar with the 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 Midwest to to um, to Northeast kind of kind of realm for states. Um, one thing that I have to finish with this is. I cannot say this enough. People have heard me say it. Minnesota is awesome when it comes to water quality assessments. And of course, the TMDLs and the wraps and the one watershed one plan. Not only is because we have we've been lucky enough to have, have a clean water fund to promote, promote this work, but we're really excellent in taking all available data and making these use determinations. Um, and the database that I showed you, the Wallace Carl world, that is far beyond what most states have. We were lucky enough to have funding. It took us eight years, but Minute and PCA worked together to build that database and that management system. Um, and we're lucky enough to use that and have that, which is far beyond what more, most states do. All right, there you go. All right. Well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. This next one is more of a, a comment that after reading the articles you mentioned at the beginning of at the beginning, um, someone's mom read those and said, Miranda seems awesome. So they just want to thank you for being such a great spokesperson for this issue and for um, the agency. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what resource is best to determine algae impairment? Is this different than a water body having algae blooms? Is that tracked anywhere? Okay, so that's a, a couple a couple things going on um, there. So when it comes when we're talking about assessments, when I'm talking about that aquatic recreation, you support on a lake, we're looking at it's the long view. So we're looking at um, 10 years worth of data. We're looking at phosphorus and algae. It's the chlorophyll that we're measuring as a determination of how much algae is growing. Got lots of chlorophyll. That means you got lots of algae. So we're looking at those in combinations. And so when we say it's impaired, we're saying that it's consistently getting algae, algal blooms. Now, the really the harmful algal blooms, the, one that look, the ones that look like green spilled paint, the ones that produce the toxins that make dogs sick, um, if those are reported, we do, we do track those, um, but they're, they're, they're so ephemeral um, that it's really, you know, it comes up to those municipalities that maintain the beaches that might put the signs out. So that's a little bit different. So for assessment, we're doing a long view. It is chlorophyll and phosphorus. For those big algal blooms, if they're reported, we track them and kind of been maintaining that for a while. And where would that, where is that tracked? If somebody wanted to go, do we have that on an outward facing website where oh, folks can see that? I don't think so. Um, I always ask Lee. Uh, so Lee uh, is the supervisor of the Lakes and Streams Monitoring Unit. And so they, they track that. I can't remember exactly where that is. It's definitely internal. I don't know if it's external. Okay. okay. Uh, our next question is a very broad topic, but what steps are being put in place for climate change and our waterways, especially related to wild rice? Oh boy. Well, so... Um, that is going to depend. My favorite answer is it depends. Like, are you talking about a stream in the Northeast? Are you talking about a lake in the Southwest? So one thing I mentioned is those rain events. So we've got more intense rain events and the, the BMPs, the implementation projects that we are not, actually not PCA, we're talking about all sorts of local units of governments, all sorts of people that need to put BMPs to protect and restore our water. Let's have to take into account these rain events. Wild rice, I, I, that one I have to say, I don't know. Um, there, I, 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 as far as the data we've collected on sulfate, um, yeah, it doesn't appear that it's just naturally increasing as the years go by. It's more related to sources in this particular case. Um, so the interesting thing about wild rice is you have these stands and they can migrate. 
So what is going to be interesting, and this is a hypothetical because we're a long ways away from it, um, climate change could change those stands, right? So it could migrate stands, and we need to be able to track where that wild rice actually grows in order to properly assess it. Those are some ideas anyway. All right, the next question is, oh, I lost my spot here in the chat. I don't, on this laptop, it's so hard to scroll because the little scroll for the chat is so tiny. All right. I'm, dealing, I'm dealing with that with the kids, like uh, school stuff. Oh my gosh, it's just, anyway, go ahead, continue. Yeah, so the next one is what's in a small, and maybe we have someone um, in the audience who could help you with this answer. Um, what can a small local group like a lake association do if they want to help fill in a data gap to complete an assessment? Yeah, so this is a good question for lakes and streams. Um, but in general, anybody can collect data. All right, so you can collect data. You're going to want to um, talk with an SWCD or a county, most likely, um, to get some really um, some good knowledge on um, how to collect and where to collect. Um, so that is true. Um, the problem with data, uh, not I get. I think really the problem is is you don't have a lack of interest in collecting data to fill those gaps. You need the funds because if you are measuring phosphorus, that day that water has to go to a lab and you got to pay for that assessment. Um, so there are resources. The um, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has something called the CLMP Plus program. Um, it's actually a pretty hot ticket to get into that program, but that is an option. You can contact um, uh, Lindsay Eggy on that. Um, but I think the best resource for anybody that's thinking local is um, go to a local SWCD and county first and see what their monitoring plans are. Um, but again, submitting data, you can submit data to the PCA, you got to jump through the hurdles, but it's doing it's it's really like getting that funding or getting that money together. Um, because one data point, it helps, but it does you really need to collect data, for example, on a lake like five times a year and do it for a couple of years for us to really get a good sense of what's going on. And I'll just make a plug here for one mm -hmm. new program is we are partnering with the Isaac Walton League of America to bring their salt watch program to Minnesota. So we're going to have um, a couple hundred kits available for Minnesotans and uh, they have a really great website and an app that you can use. Um, where you can go and request these chloride test strips and you can test your local lake or stream. It's like a preliminary, you know, assessment. It's not something that um, we might be able to use for our assessment purposes, but something that could be a really great indicator um, to help us know if we need to put a little more resources and find some of those funds to do additional monitoring for chloride. So if you are interested in that program, that is free and available to anyone in Minnesota. You just go to the Isaac Walton League website and request a free kit. All right. See, there's all awesome. kinds of benefits to me volunteering to help out with the <laughs> <laughs> perfect <laughs> opportunities when I can. Um, adding to Melissa's thoughts, as we move back to the beginning of the list for assessment, it would be interesting to see if we can draw any conclusions on how water bodies impairments change into climate change impacts, higher temperatures, more or less rainfall, etc. Mm, that's a really good point um, because. Um, with all the things that was full in my head today, I don't remember if I really mentioned that. Okay, so we've monitored and assessed every watershed in the state. We're already started going around and monitoring the watersheds again. So this 2020 impaired waters list and these 20 assessments up until now that we've collected this 10 years, these last 10 years, serves as a good baseline. Um, I really think that's important going forward. We'll be able to document trends. And yeah, that uh, climate change being a piece of that, um, where are we getting more impairments of this variety edging up more in the Northeast because we're getting, anyway, so, so um, it will be interesting what the next uh, 10 years brings when we go around and make that trip around the state again. It's a good point, thanks. So next one, uh, thanks Miranda. Your presentation suggests we have pretty good data both qualitatively and quantitatively. How do you think we get more Plum Creek stories to happen? That is, connect the energy and efforts of folks who are working for restoration and protection locally in their watersheds to the state machinery that you describe here. This is what I have focused my entire career on, but from what perspective 
from my perspective, MPCA and the state in general does not invest in this aspect of the watershed approach to the level needed to make real change happen, the people part and connecting the dots. Mm-hmm. May I ask who offered that comment? Who do you think? Do you have a <laughs> vote? It's Lori. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Oh, perfect. Um, no, so great. I would agree to that. It is a challenge. So when I get a, a, something like Plum Creek, it's a sense, it's gobs of data, right? I don't get a story. I'm just asked, okay, we need to run an assessment on Plum Creek because we think it's meeting standards. So that 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 reach out to try to get those stories has been a learning experience. It's been a long time coming. Part of the struggle is sometimes there just aren't really good stories. Um, Sometimes it's it's really tracking those down. I feel like there has been, that process has not been good. I will say that I've been working on it. Carol Sinden has helped me on that and I have her to thank for it. What I'm hoping is with the, 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 the movement into from, the movement into watershed approaches and watershed restoration pressure strategies and the board of and Bowser's one watershed, one plan. That's where I'm hoping in the future to mine for stories. I started looking at that in 2020, but we were so early in that one watershed, one plan process. So if you remember that Bowser is is implementing, it's handing out the cash to implement some projects. And so if we can get success stories of delisting on a stream and the one watershed, one plan is is what tells us, okay, this is what we did. And then making those connections because those one watershed, one plans are mined out to local SWCDs. Those are the people that did the work. So those are making those connections I'm hoping is going to be easier. Um, but I, but the real, like what, what worries me is just getting, is just getting waters off the list. Like uh, because of all the reasons we talked about climate change and, and decreased funds and implementation and um, that restoring our aquatic systems just takes time. I'm afraid that turnaround is going to be a long time in the making, Um, but I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to find a few good stories every year so often. There are some out there, but unfortunately, um, it just takes time to implement these changes. One other, um, you know, suggestion I might have for that piece, because that's something that I think, you know, has been an interest or a passion of mine as well as kind of that aspect of our work and engaging Mm -hmm. more with um, these local activities is connecting with other programs who have those connections. Because I know, you know, a lot of our agency's work isn't necessarily really directly connected with those local partners. And so like the watershed program is a great place or RMAD, there's a ton of different programs that really do work um, collaboratively and have assistance that can help these communities. And they might, you know, they might know some of these stories or have some more direct connections. So um, just a, an opportunity too to partner with other aspects of the agency, yeah, the program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Laura Milberg has a question about the climate change comments is, um, our cl- question is climate change has been associated with increased elbow blooms. Is this also associated with increased algae, chlorophyll, and phosphorus in water bodies? What climate change factors would contribute to such an increase? Oh, um, good, good. Um, so a lot. Um, there's so much there. And again, there are people on this call that know more about this stuff than I do. So I will I will try to focus my, my focus my response in a couple of specifics. So warmer weather that definitely in a lake bakes it and that warmer weather is going to fuel those algae blooms so warmer weather definitely um in both lakes and streams those downpours those rain events that are flushing runoff into like like the st croix think about that giant watershed after a huge rain event it takes a, it takes a, some time, but that water flushes all that sediment and all that phosphorus, all that nutrients into the river. And then it slows down in the river and it's sunlit and it's warm and it's calm and that's going to fuel the algae as well. So those are some 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 examples of what's going to what's going to continue to be a challenge. 
All right. Um, we have another comment here, uh, which is, is great, uh, from Carol, that says the success we had with Plum Creek was having the watershed project manager, Phil Votruba, and myself take the time to engage with the local citizens and SWC staff. The locals were very involved, even recruiting a U of M professor who's an expert. So that was exactly kind of what I was saying is that's, a, that's yeah. how you got to get that stuff happen is we need to make connections with our other programs in the agency who do work more closely with our local partners and have um, that direct linkage and that opportunity to really um, pull those stories out and help them create more solid stories. So Perfect. that's great. Thanks for sharing that, Carol. And if I don't see any other questions or comments in here. All right. Well, you guys know where to find me. There's my contact information. I can talk about wa uh, water quality assessments all day. If you think of a question, just uh, ping me and, and we can talk about it. I'd love to share more with you guys. Yeah, Miranda, that was a great talk. Thanks for uh, agreeing to do it. I sure learned a lot about impaired waters that I never knew. And it drew a lot of information together that uh that makes a lot of sense now thanks for thanks for putting the presentation together for us thank you for asking me it really was a pleasure long time listener first time presenter this is excellent thank you yes, so much. and that's a good point the long time listener first time presenter if there is any others of you in that same boat we are always looking for speakers for these water issues talk and I, it was really great conversation we had when miranda when we were kind of getting set up here is how much she appreciated this um venue that we have across the agency, especially at a time when none of us are in the office anymore, or most of us are not in the office. So we want to continue to host these for you guys every two weeks and have really great content. Uh, but we do need help with getting that content because we don't always know what everybody's up to. And if somebody has some great new um, topics or research or projects that they've been doing that they think everybody would be interested in learning. So please reach out to myself or Mark um, and let us know if you uh, are interested in being a presenter at one of our upcoming talks. I think, Mark, we have some availability um, in the next uh, two months here. We have a couple. We're looking actually for quite a few speakers. So, well, actually, uh, that's a that's a good point. I'm glad you bring that up. On September 24th, we actually have an opening. We don't have a speaker lined up. If somebody has a presentation that they would like to give, kind of off the shelf, that'd be great. Um, we could certainly plug that in for the 24th. We also have October 22nd. I'm doing this off the top of my head. Um, October 22nd open as well. Um, and then I think one more opening after that. And then we're kind of into the new year because uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas intrude. Um, but yeah, we do have a couple of openings. If somebody would like to share what they're doing, it's a great way for the rest of us to uh, kind of keep track of what what we're all doing out there. So uh, yeah, give us a uh, give us a shout out and um, let us know if you'd like to present on something you're something you're working on. And uh, I will mention that we do record all of these ses sessions, and we have a water issues YouTube uh, site where we post all of the recorded. Um, WebEx events that we posted. So um, we can, um, I think, Mark, we have that that we've emailed out in the past. Um, so we can include that maybe in a future water issues email just to make sure everybody has the link to that. Um, so that's a that's a great idea. Uh, thanks for the reminder on that. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Thank you again to Miranda for your wonderful talk. And uh, we will hopefully see you all in two weeks. Thank you, guys. Have a yeah, wonderful thanks. day. Yep. Good thanks luck everyone. with uh, distance learning. Everyone. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.